right. Good morning. Good morning to you. Welcome to Connors Hill and Southeast as well, who are tied in this morning. Um, so we are we are talking this year from Psalm one about the life of blessing, the life of thriving, the life of abundance, the life of fulfillment. And in Psalm 1, we read that that does not come through rooting ourselves unintentionally just wherever our roots go into the society around us, but it comes instead through an intentionality with our root system and digging deep into the good things that come from the Lord. That person, the thriving person, is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. And so the encouragement is to take a look at your root system. And if you're willing to experiment together, to pursue greater thriving in the directives of Scripture. We talked a few weeks back about daily Scripture. We're going through these four starter structure root system things, daily Scripture. And I want to keep inviting you to daily start your day or find a place in your day to open the word and ask Jesus to speak to you, to teach you. Uh, We talked last week about the Sabbath rhythm, a balance between working hard and resting well and to have weekly worship as the pinnacle of your rest. Today we're going to talk about authentic community and next week about apprenticing with Jesus. But today, uh, Starter Structure 3, Authentic Community, I, as we pursue thriving, I want to say to you, thriving is not an individual pursuit. <laughs> I hope if you interact with anything written for our church, it will say on it, following Jesus together. This is so key and core in how we have been invited to pursue thriving. You might choose to live your life alone Or you might choose to be around a lot of people, but actually not deeply connected in relationships. But let me promise you, you will never be able to thrive alone. So today I want to invite you into the beauty and life that is available. If you would genuinely share your life more deeply with brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to invite you deeper. And when I think about beauty and I think about life... And I think about going deeper. I think about snorkeling. Don't you? On this beautiful winter day (laughs) with snow coming tomorrow. Uh, Snorkeling. Have some of you had the opportunity to snorkel? I think I've had the opportunity three times in my life to snorkel in and around coral reefs. And, you know, you watch the Planet Earth series or some BBC documentary with David Attenborough, and you think, I want to be around a coral reef. I want to see striped yellow fish and octopuses or octopi or however you say that. You know, I want to be part of that. So when I was a young adult, still single, a few friends of mine and I had the opportunity to be somewhere warm, and we decided we're going snorkeling. And it was actually the last day we didn't want to pay for any instruction or any boat out to any special place. So we went to Walmart or somewhere like that and bought the cheapest possible snorkels and flippers and uh, and goggles. And we had heard that just off the coast, but a ways off the coast, about a half kilometer off this one part of the coast, was where you really were supposed to go. So there was this reef. You had to go out there. It was quite a long swim. But we decided, let's go for it. We're young. We're tough. I didn't really know at that time, and I wish I had, but that you actually can find a place of relaxing and snorkeling if you keep your eyes under the water. You know, you can breathe deeply. I was just swimming with all my might. I mean, probably for an hour we were on our way there and back, and I was sweating. I thought I was going to die. The ground was like 40 feet below me under the water, and I was like, ah! You know, and my goggles were cheap, so they were filling with water. But we eventually got out there, and it took courage, and it took a lot of exertion, but we eventually got out there, and it was spectacular. (laughs) You know, boats just fly over this uh, this flat water with you know whatever and but if you get your eyes under it was absolutely incredible some people were having the the courage and skill to actually swim down and see stuff closer but just an amazing variety of fish and all kinds of things we actually saw this manta ray like this big shark i think that's what it's called quite a ways away from us but i could see it really clearly and i was just making sure to keep one slower person between me and the ray Uh, So I could get back if I needed to. 
And I got back and I was just exhausted. It took so much energy and it took a lot of courage, but it was worth it. And more recently, I've had the opportunity to snorkel again. Um, The courage that I have to muster now, more and more as I get older, is just the courage to take off my shirt as an old man in front of people. Um, (laughs) But so beautiful if you would dig in and take courage and get your eyes beneath the water. And so today, simply, I want to invite you deeper. I want to say to you, there is more. There is more beauty. There is more life. It will take courage. It will take skill. It will take maturity. It will take some work. But there is beauty beneath the surface. And we get this special opportunity to practice eternal authentic community as brothers and sisters in Christ. So today, I want to just walk you through this Romans passage, and it's kind of what I'm fighting for all day is, would you go deeper? (laughs) Would you risk again? Would you take courage again? Would you open your heart? Even if you would say, I'm surrounded by amazingly deep community, would you go another level deeper? Would you open your heart? Would you welcome people in? Three things we're going to see in Romans today that we'll walk through. Humility, service, and love. A call to be humble, a call to serve, and a call to sincerely love one another. First off, humility. Authentic community starts with having an accurate view of who we are in Jesus. Authentic community starts with having an accurate view of who we are in Jesus. Look at verse 3. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, (laughs) but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of us. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but soberly. Humility is an accurate view of who we are. We are not called in Christ to be humiliated, to think nothing of ourselves or to throw ourselves on the ground like a doormat, but we are called to be humble, to think of ourselves accurately. And I would say to you that until we see ourselves in an accurate way, we won't be able to interact with others in a healthy way. We will be too arrogant or too insecure Or if you're highly skilled like me, kind of a weird combination of both of those things all of the time. (laughs) And we know this. When we're arrogant or we're insecure, it gets in the way of relationships. When we are arrogant or feeling proud or thinking too highly of ourselves, we might not be able to listen too well to others because it's not about them. It's about us. We might find ourselves in conflict with others because we've mistreated them. We might become angry because we think our problems are completely the fault of other people. We might have blind spots and just get stuck in life at a low level of maturity. We might lose the trust of others when they see we're just in it for ourselves. And so big, we might not be able to realize and remember our desperate need for grace, both from God and from others. We might not be able to do these simple child-level tasks of relationship, saying we're sorry and asking people to forgive us. And over time, we may find ourselves more and more and more alone. Don't be arrogant. (laughs) But how many of you know that insecurity is not a whole lot better? Insecurity is not helpful either. We can find ourselves, when we're insecure, becoming jealous, suspicious of others. We might have self-doubt or self-criticism in relationships. We might become overly dependent and just drain the life out of other people. We might struggle to be honest with others when we need to be, especially in times of conflict. It might be hard to trust others. We might actually try to control others out of our insecurity. And we might actually cause the very things we're afraid of. In relationships, we might push people away. We might hijack the depth in relationships because we're afraid. And at the core of this, so big, we might not actually believe that we're worthy of being loved. And we might not be willing to risk and to open our hearts to God and our lives to others. And over time, we might find ourselves exactly where arrogance brought us more and more and more alone. The key in this is to see ourselves and others 
through Jesus Christ. Weeks ago, I said from 2 Corinthians 5, this, this line is so important. From now on, because of our relationship with Christ, we don't see anybody from a worldly point of view, Paul writes. We don't look at people for their position or for their wealth or for their beauty or for their intelligence or for how nice of a pool they have in their backyard. We look at them through Christ. They are a dearly loved child of God. And Paul writes today that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but we should think of ourselves in accordance with the faith God has given us. This is to to look at ourselves through the lens of the gospel. And when we look at ourselves through the lens of the gospel, we can arrive at what many people would call healthy humility, confident humility, confident humility. Remembering that we have sinful nature and tendencies, that helps us stay away from becoming conceited and arrogant. But remembering our place in God through Jesus keeps us from being insecure. This is a call for you and I that's really at the foundation of having good relationships is confident humility. I remember a number of years ago, I got the opportunity to go to this camp with a number of people from our church, and a bunch of us adults had the opportunity to go around on a high ropes course. Have you been on a high ropes course? You go way higher than you should, but you strap yourself in, and then if you fall, you're hanging in this really uncomfortable harness. You know, basically, that's how it works. But I remember, I wasn't there when it happened, but the six-year-old was telling me a story. Uh, He was there with his, his group. And he went up to the leap of faith. And the way the leap of faith works is it's about a 15-foot telephone pole. And you climb up on the pole. And then when you get to the top of the pole, you don't just hang on the top. You climb a little bit further. You're roped in. And you stand on the top of the pole like a monk from hundreds of years ago, just standing there. And then you try to get up the courage because there is a volleyball hanging about five feet away. You harness in. But you try to get up the courage to jump, to leap, and smash that volleyball. Of course, if the rope doesn't hold... And you're 60 years old, you're in trouble, you know, just to say, probably if you're five years old as well. But you have to get up the courage to believe that the rope will hold you. And this man, the 60-year-old man, wanted to do it. He got up there and he just couldn't pull himself to do it. He actually started to weep with childlike fear in the situation that he was in. Because he's like, if I splat to the ground, that's going to be really bad. But eventually, through tears, he got up the courage And he just went for it. (laughs) And he jumped off this thing and he smashed the volleyball and he was lowered down safely in tears to his team, high-fiving him and hugging him. This beautiful picture of our lives. We are completely in trouble if we're on our own, you know. But we're completely safe to explore when we're connected to the rope. So this rope is a picture of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Yes, the, the, the journey is challenging and there are pitfalls, but click on the rope and jump for it. How do you see yourself? How do you look at yourself? Are you arrogant? Are you insecure? Or are you growing to see yourself through Jesus and to carry yourself with confident humility? Humility, an accurate view of who we are. In Jesus Christ. Second, service. Authentic community is not inactive. It's not inactive. Authentic community grows as we use our God given gifts to build up His church. It grows among us as brothers and sisters in Christ as we use our God given gifts to build up His church. And Paul returns, if you are a Bible reader, to his familiar body metaphor. Verse For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. The body analogy is helpful because we can think about the parts of the body. You know, a finger, a finger finds its meaning (laughs) by being connected to the hand and the arm and the rest of the body, a foot finds its meaning, a nose finds its meaning, a nose lying off on the ground by itself is not going to be very useful and it's not going to last too long. Birds will be eating it soon. Think about that. But when we're connected, 
noses are really nice. How many of you lost your smell when you got COVID, you know, and you're so happy when it comes back that you can smell and taste your food once again. When a, when a piece of the body is severed or even just inactive and not working, it hurts the whole body, and it is very unhealthy for that part. There's this familiar body metaphor that Paul calls us into, but he's not just talking about the parts, he's talking about the function. And so I want you to personalize this, take this on for you. He says, if you are in Christ, he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If if it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So there is a call for each of us to function. Throughout the New Testament, there is this Greek word charisma, which is a picture of a special ability or abilities that God gives to a believer to work together to build up the church. Charisma, a special ability. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ in faith, He has given you gifts that are useful and that are important for the family of God, the body of Christ, to function as it is intended to function. Now, praise be to God, God has not called you to be somebody else or to use somebody else's gifts. And he has not called you to compare yourself. Have you ever heard somebody share about what they're doing for God and you think to yourself, wow, I could never do that. Well, praise be to God. He's not asking you to. (laughs) He's asking you to do what he's called you to do. I love 1 Peter 4.11 because it, it separates into two general categories of gifts, speaking and serving. Peter says, if anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. And I just want to say, some of you, I might or might not be in this category, but some of you talk a lot, you know? Great! (laughs) If you speak, if you are able to string together complete sentences, then do it as one who speaks the very words of God. Use your speaking to build up the body of Christ. But Peter goes on. (laughs) If anyone serves, not all of us talk as much as others. Some of us really like to get in there and roll up our sleeves and use our hands and do stuff. Wonderful! If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things, both speaking and serving, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. I just want to give this special encouragement, especially to the second half of those people, to the speakers, too. But so often the people that we hear about churchy kind of stuff from are the speaking gift people because those are the people who are talking all the time. You know, whether up front or in the foyer, it's the speaking gift people that are always talking about what it looks like to follow Christ and serve Him. And sometimes if your gifts are more weighted towards the serving gift kind of thing, we can think like, I can't be very useful for God until I can learn to talk more. <laughs> and I love First Peter, because Peter says, whatever. You know, speaking and serving, and of course, all of us are combinations of those things. But use them. What's the point of it? All through First Corinthians and other parts in the Bible, we read that using your gifts is in order to build up the church. So Paul says, whatever you got, just bring it to the family. Use it. Step into the projects. <laughs> that are happening and participate. And I want to speak this word to you, these two words. Just start. <laughs> this is how you find how you are gifted in the body of Christ. Now, some of you who may have been a part of a church for a long time may have participated in taking a spiritual gift inventory, you know, where you fill out all these questions and then it spits out an answer. Here's what you're gifted at. Here's your top three spiritual gifts. I don't have any problem with those. I've taken many, many, many of those in my life, but that's really not the best way to find how you are gifted to serve in the church. And in fact, I think it can be an opportunity to stay bashful, an opportunity to stay in the back wings and say, like, I don't really know where I'm gifted, or uh, these are my gifts, and nobody's giving me an opportunity to use them. 
Instead, I would like to encourage you, like Paul, just start. Here's what we're up to. (laughs) We're trying to love each other, body of Christ. We're trying to help one another mature, grow up as disciples of Christ. We're trying to share the wonderful news of Jesus Christ beyond the gathering, into the work and school and neighborhood and extended families of our lives. We're trying to be Jesus' hands and feet, working for mercy and justice, lifting the poor and the oppressed. That's the sort of stuff that we're doing as a church. So just start. (laughs) Is there a way that you could do some of that? Is there a way that you see somebody doing some things that resonate with your heart that you'd like to say, I'd like to help? It's sort of like if I said to you, what, what, what position are you best at in football? What position are you best at? Many of you might say with me, well, I've heard of a quarterback, and I've seen some linebackers, but I don't actually really know because I've never really played football. But imagine if you went and just started playing football with your friends. Over time, they would say things like, you're really bad at passing. <laughs> You shouldn't be the quarterback. You're also really bad at catching. So we're not going to make you the wide receiver. Could you just go knock some people over? And I don't know what the other positions are called. But you'd find your way into it if you just played the game. Or what if I said to you, what is your favorite cross-stitching technique? And you said, I don't know. But if there was some sort of inventory where I could share my heart, maybe I could find. No. The way you find your favorite cross-stitching technique is start Cross-stitching, that's not a personal encouragement to you. It's just an illustration. Um, Over Thanksgiving, we had the opportunity to have a lot of people in our house and eat some turkey and people brought food and all this. And there's a lot of work to be done, you know, with all kinds of hands needed to put out food, to get it set up, to clean it up afterwards. You know, and I feel like sometimes in the church, we're like sitting back going, I don't know, like... I see there's dishes that need to be dried, but my spiritual gift inventory doesn't say I'm good at drying dishes, so I'm not going to do that. And it's like, but that's not how you do family. Family, you just all get in there. If there's wet dishes and a dry towel, you pick up. I mean, a lot of us don't. I understand that. But what you should do is you should pick up the towel and you should start drying the dishes. Or better yet, go to the person who's obviously running the show. There's always one or two of them. And ask them, like, what could I do? Are there some ways I could be I could be involved? Jesus in the parable of the talents tells us there's one really important way not to use your spiritual gifts, and that's to not use them. <laughs> don't bear whatever you do, don't bury your gifts. You might say, Well, I wish I had ten talents. I only got two. Jesus sort of says, whatever you have, just use it and it will be a good investment. And it will be worth it. And I just want to say to you all, it is actually fun (laughs) to learn how to be a good team at football and win. It is fun to eat turkey. It is fun to receive a return on an investment. I have no idea if it's fun to cross-stitch or not, but people seem to keep doing it. There is joy when we use our gifts and see what God is going to do with them. And when we do... The church gets built up. I want to encourage you. If this is your church family, if Central's your church, help out in a variety of ways. Pretend you're at a big turkey dinner. Make that the metaphor for church. Just show up. Bring some food. Arrange the dishes. Just sidle up to what's happening and say, I can help with that. That's how we do stuff. Serve in a variety of ways, and the church will be built up. But you got to decide. I can't do that for you. You got to step forward. You got to raise your hand. You got to try it out, and you got to persevere. Do you believe that God has given you gifts that are useful and important for building the church? And will you obey Him and step into the joy of working together with Him to build the church and bring His kingdom service? Community grows as we use our God-given gifts to build the church. Third, love. The foundation of all of this, the purpose behind it, the motivation behind it is love. Authentic community is mature. Not when we do a bunch of stuff with precision effectiveness, but when we truly put others first in our thoughts, words, and actions. This is the win. This is the win for the church. This is what God is up to. 
(laughs) This is the ministry, reconciling people towards God and towards one another. What we're going to be up to for eternity is living lives of love. That's the bullseye. And so Paul spends quite a bit of time in verses 9 to to, uh, 21 here talking about what it looks like. What are some of the things we run after to pursue authentic and deep community? I just want to read through these verses and just make a couple comments. Just let these settle on your hearts, and I think just apply all the way through. God, is that what's happening in me? God, help that to happen in me. God, how do I need to change for that to happen in me? So let's just go through these. Verse 9. Love must be sincere. It's got to be real. It's got to be authentic. It, 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 it can't be fake. The word here is that it can't be hypocritical in the Greek. This is, this is this word that means actor. Don't just be acting love. Don't fake it till you make it. Actually cry out to God to change your heart, to give you tender-hearted compassion for other people, especially your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. He says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Such a powerful uh, pair here. Because in our world, we actually value authenticity in our society. But we value being authentically evil just as much as we value being authentically good. (laughs) You know, a good villain movie where the villain's actually the star. (laughs) Or in our morality, as long as you're being true to yourself, live however you want. Well, not so with brothers and sisters in Christ. Be real, be sincere, be authentic, but hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Live an upright life in your choices. Be devoted to one another in love. Be devoted, not just a shallowness, but a devotion. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. This verse literally says in the original language, let yourself be on fire by the Spirit. Be on fire by the Spirit. I want to encourage some enthusiasm. Again, not fake enthusiasm. (laughs) Holy Spirit fired up enthusiasm that the passion for the kingdom of God would explode into the body of Christ. Let yourself be on fire. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. What he's calling us to in this verse is just to keep going. Stay joyful. Stay patient. Stay faithful. Keep praying. He says, verse 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need. I I, I love the Greek in this verse. What it means is actually come into fellowship with the needs of the saints. Take that on a little bit. He's saying, you know, because you can feel when somebody says, I have this need. I don't know about you, but I often can feel like, good luck with that. (laughs) This verse calls us to act that I would actually come into fellowship. I would be a friend with your need. I would take that need on as my own. Again, out of a place of confident humility, not becoming a doormat, not letting y'all tell me how I have to live my life, but that I would actually love you enough to take on some of the needs of this community as if they were my own needs. He also says, practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. And hospitality in Greek means friends with strangers. Friends with strangers. That we would be a welcoming community. That we would not just be looking for those two or three people we feel most comfortable with, but that we would live our lives thinking this, thinking this thought. Do you know what? Most of my friends didn't used to be my friends. Ah, so what that means is every single stranger I run into could possibly be one of my future friends. I'm going to make friends with strangers. Now, we're not all terribly extroverted. I feel a little uncomfortable around people who are too extroverted and public around strangers. So just find that cool balance somewhere. But open your arms, open your heart. I pray for this for my kids so often as they got into junior high and high school, because I remember junior high and high school. I would, I, I would encourage my kids and pray for my kids, look, hang out with everybody. Be friends with everybody. Don't, don't try to avoid people because they're cool or popular. <laughs> but don't be overly focused on people because they're cool or popular. And whatever you do, if you're in a group of people who are talking and somebody else is standing in the corner, go over and tell them to come stand with you. <laughs> you know, 
be hospitable people. Have eyes open for people who need to be included. Bless those who persecute you. What a call in our time. Bless and do not curse. Sometimes we just mope around and we want to fight back and punch back when we're persecuted. That is not the call of Jesus Christ. Is there persecution against the church and against the kingdom of God in our time? Yes. It's obviously more intense in other parts of the world where you can't publicly worship. But yes, there are extremely loud voices against following Jesus in our time. So what do we do? We bless. <laughs> we don't curse. We don't punch. We bless. We love. We invite. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. You know what this is telling us? It's telling us to get some feels going on. Don't just like do the job being a church person. Feel it. God, break my heart. Give me compassion. Give me compassion. You know, compassion to celebrate <laughs> when somebody gets a better promotion at work than I do. <laughs> compassion to actually literally celebrate other people's wins, but also compassion to mourn and grieve like it is my own thing to mourn and grieve. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. He's really reiterating so many of the same ideas here. Do not repay anyone for evil, uh, evil for evil. Be careful to do what is, in, what is right in the eyes of everyone. And we'll just land here. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The idea is this. The kingdom of heaven is about mature, reconciled relationships. So try to live that out. The king of heaven is one who taught and exemplified, love your enemies. So try by the strength of the spirit to actually live that out. Try with God's strength to truly put others first in your thoughts, in your words, in your actions. Because when we do this, the eternal community called the church will be built up. Kind of a last thought here. Um, historically, lots of people uh, wrote and taught the golden rule before the time of Jesus, negatively. So they would say, and you can find it all over the place, don't do to other people what you don't want them to do to you. <laughs> That's very good advice. That's the ba that's basic parenting from about age zero to five. It's just don't do stuff that you don't want people to do to you. That's it. If you can get that by age five, you're actually doing pretty good compared to average. But Jesus historically is the first person in the history of the world to state the golden rule in the positive. Jesus says, do to others what you would want them to do to you. And in a way that only a God-man could do, <laughs> he raised the bar. Because I'll tell you something, I can probably sit in my basement for the next year, as long as I don't have my cell phone with me, and avoid offending you. I could probably pull that off. I cannot sit in my basement for the next year and do to you what I would want you to do unto me. Jesus says, get out of the basement. <laughs> get active in your love. Be humble people in the body of Christ. Dig deeper. Pursue authentic community. Serve one another. Use your gifts. Build one another up. And at the core of it, truly grow in actually loving one another. This is what you're designed for. This is what you're built and created for. And this is the humility, service, and love of our Savior, the King of kings, the King of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus Christ. So give your life to him. Let him teach you how to live, and let's dig deep as brothers and sisters in Christ. What do you want to do? Should we stay where we're at, or should we go deeper? <laughs> should we put on our goggles, learn how to swim, and explore and experience the depth of community in the, in, in the family of God?
that we've been designed for. A few on-ramps as we land here first. Keep on growing your daily scripture and weekly worship habits. I won't re-preach those sermons, but I encourage you in those things. Second, serve faithfully in the community of Central in a variety of ways. I just simply want to say, talk to a site pastor, another staff member, or go to the website under the next step, steps page. It says, serve, find a place to serve. Third, decide to follow Jesus intentionally together with a smaller group. I just want to simply ask you, do you have a place at least a few times a month where somebody asks you, how are you doing really? <laughs> and gives you time to answer. There's so much opportunity to cross the life of our church. Obviously, we do this with kids. We have an awesome youth group. If you want to get involved in that, we have a young adults group. There's all kinds of home groups. There's men's and women's groups. There's seniors groups. But really, at the core of it is, where in your life are you intentional? Yes, go to church and be with hundreds of people. And yes, as you live your life informally, be a loving person. But who are those two or three or five or ten people that you're actually following Jesus together with in an authentic and open and growing way. Next week, we'll look at apprenticing with Jesus from Colossians 3. But we're going to respond in a moment of worship here. And I just invite you to stand with me. I want to pray. And at Connors Hill in Southeast as well, let me pray. So, Jesus, we want to thank you that you have not called us to life alone, but you've called us to life together, to a shared pursuit of you. <laughs> and God, maybe I could confess with many, many voices and hearts here that there are times when it feels like it would just be easier to do it alone. But God, I pray you would press against that lie in our hearts to show us the richness, the beauty, the life that is available in community. God, for those who have been deeply hurt and find themselves deeply hesitant to open themselves, God, would you lead each of us into finding that right space to truly share our lives openly? And God, may we be a welcoming community as brothers and sisters in Christ. May our arms and our lives and even our homes be open to that next person that you would want to bring into our lives. Jesus, we want to follow your example. You've called us to love one another like you have loved us. So help us to do it, Lord, by the strength and power of your Holy Spirit. And in it, may we experience a deeper level of thriving than we ever have in our lives. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.